me and Simon are going to be talking about AEP, which is a uh, process design or an architecture design um, that we're doing at Embercosm. Um, I'm going to be talking about the architecture itself at sort of a high level. Um, and then after I've talked, I'll hand over to Simon. And um, Simon will talk about the simulator um, that we've written for it. So, and there's sort of, this is a internal project for Embercosm. Um, our main business is working, writing tools for uh, other architectures. So, uh, uh, new company uh, companies which have new architectures and need a compiler, a linker, a debugger. Um, we we do that work basically, and this is this is helping our our core business. So, first of all, I'm going to go into what AAP is. So. This is what it looks like, a uh, sort of high-level block diagram. Um, it's Harvard architecture, so the code and the data are completely separate. Um, we've got a variable number of registers. I'll talk about that a bit more later, um, which varies between 4 and 64 registers. Um, they're 16 bits wide each. Um, so, And all of the operations work on 16 bits. We've got uh, sort of 16 bits worth of data memory, so up to 64 kilobytes of data memory, and 24, kilo, uh, 24 bits of um, code, which is word addressed. So we've got 16 mega words of, of code, maximum addressable. So at the moment, um, the architecture all looks very sane. So it's RISC. So it's a RISC architecture and it's load store, so if you want to do anything, you have to load from your memory into your registers, do the operation there and push it back. Um, the, at the moment, the instruction set's relatively straightforward. There's nothing that surprising in there. But the, the purpose of this architecture is um, mainly to form a, a good basis. Um, so it's simple at the moment, and it's going to become more complicated as we add new things and we try new things out. So. That's basically what I said just now. Um, so I want to go into a bit about the motivation of why we're doing this. So as I said, our, our main business is working on compilers and things. Um, so why come up with a ISA? Why come up with an architecture? So the reason for doing that is basically, well, there's a number of reasons. One, that uh, it's very, very good for training. Um, if we've got new employees, uh, new people, or if we want to help out with the community, um, then it's very good if you're trying to learn how to write compilers to have something to do, basically, that is, it doesn't involve digging deep into the x86 um, compilers or the ARM compilers, which are very massive and complicated. So having a good basis, which is well documented and open, um, it's very useful from that perspective. Um, for us, it's um, very useful for experimenting with new features. So, and this ties into the main point, which is basically that we have customers come to us and want new architectures, uh, or want a new compiler for their new architecture, and we can't necessarily talk about that architecture. That architecture, um, the compiler for it, the tools for it, can't necessarily be upstream in the code bases. So we can't necessarily have our self-entry in the main source code for LVM, GCC, and similar. But we would like to have something in tree which represent that, represents that architecture, um, because otherwise we're working out of tree, so we're working on our own. Um, and we have to maintain everything. We have to make sure that nothing in the main tree compiler breaks anything we're doing. We have to maintain that compatibility. Um, and we, we can't necessarily, we, can't, we don't have some architecture in tree which we can push our changes back and give back to the community. So, so that's the main reason that we, um, that we want to do this. And from that perspective, the experimentation side's very true as well. So um, by being, uh, by having an architecture which we can play around with and modify, we can, if a customer has some strange or interesting feature in their architecture, we can add it to our architecture, implement it there, demonstrate it can be done, um, and then we can push that into the main tree if it's allowable or otherwise it's good practice. It's good to demonstrate we can do something. Um, 
So I just wanted to quickly go into a couple of the problems. So this is to try and address some problems that we've seen in compilers. And we want to fix things that we see in those compilers when it stumbles on an architectural feature that isn't represented in tree. Um, so we want to address that. And so I'm going to talk about a couple of the things that we've, we've had to address uh, in even in this relatively simple arch architecture thus far. So the main premise is that uh, compilers often assume that your architectures are boring and straightforward. Um, they are not used to having very weird architectures, things like DSPs throw a spanner in the works a bit and get more difficult to implement. Um, so an example we've got in AAP, we've got this data memory is only 16 bits. Our registers are 16 bits, so a register can reference to all of our data memory, and that's, that's all well and good. Our code memory, however, is too big. We can't reference all of it. So things like function pointers, we, we can't reference a, um, all of our code memory through a single register, so our function pointers can't live in a single register. So we then have to pair up our registers, and that itself isn't a problem. Compilers handle that fine. Um, the difficulty comes when you want to do both of these. So we've got some things we want to reference with one register, some things we want to reference with two. So when we're using functions, we want two, two registers to talk about it. Uh, when we're referencing data, we want one. However, the compiler tends to assume that one pointer size fits all. So you have one pointer, and that is assumed to be big enough for both. So that gives us a couple of choices. You use the smaller amount because it's more efficient and try and reference everything with it. Uh, but now you can't use that for all of your code, which is not helpful. <laughs> and sometimes you can get around that with some workaround or some hack, but that's not very ideal. The alternative is that you use two registers in a pair everywhere. So all of your data you reference with two registers. Uh, and that's just mind-blowingly inefficient, and you don't want to do that either. So overall, the actual problem can bo be boiled down to we just need to fix this assumption in the compiler. Um, it's an assumption that doesn't hold for us, and it's an assumption that doesn't hold for our customers. So uh, it needs to be fixed. Um, so and another issue that we come across, so uh, we're a load store architecture. Um, we can only do calculations when something's in the register file. Uh, so we have to first load things in and store them out once we run out. So once we've run out of registers, we have to shuffle values between the registers and memory. We can't operate directly on the memory. And that code to do that, to do the shuffling, spilling and reloading of registers, that's all produced by the compiler. So if we've got our obvious example, which is C plus D. We've got some stuff in some registers already, and we've got the values here. We first have to store what's already there. So store one register, two registers, out to these. Then we load in our values that we actually want to do the calculations on, which is C and D. And then finally, we actually do the add. Now, in all of that, we've got five instructions here to do the add. Four of them are completely useless. They're not doing anything interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we, we do this operation, C plus D. We've got this, this is the actual guts where that operation is happening, but we've got to do all of this shuffling of stuff um, to actually do that operation. And you want to minimize that, basically. Um, and this compilers do a reasonably good job of this, um, but it's quite a hard problem. It's quite difficult to compute how to <coughs> spill and restore registers, when to pu push stuff to memory, and when to pull them back. Um, the problem we have is that in compilers, there's often the assumption that you have quite a lot of registers. So you've got at least eight registers or 16. And when you've got eight or 16 registers, it doesn't matter quite as much if you don't use them all quite as effectively. Um, if you waste one register out of eight, 
mm, that's not so bad. But if you've only got four registers, as we're aiming to support with AAP, you've lost a quarter of your register space just because you've, you're using it inefficiently. So we're, we're addressing this, which is basically handling this case where everything is um, much more constrained than, than targets are typically used to. So those are basically a couple of the problems we've seen. There are a whole bundle of other thing, smaller things that we've um, encountered, but basically these, these are the kind of things we see, and we want to fix these in compilers, and we want to fix them in a way that we can put those fixes into the main source tree and have them be supported and maintain support for them. So back to sort of the high-level view. So this is where AEP has come from. It um, started out at FOSDEM last year, um, and that was Simon's. Um, Simon did the initial ISA design and did the initial compiler. He brought that up incredibly quickly. We did a big bundle of development in this gap here. And then uh, a year ago, almost exactly a year ago, uh, we had a high school student come in to do an FPG FPGA implementation, and that runs on a D0 nano. Um, and that was Dan Gorringe, and that's also available. Um, we talked about it at Orconf, and we also talked about it at FOSDEM this year. And just before the end of last year, uh, Simon started working on the simulator, uh, which is what he's going to talk about now. So the current state of things, we've got our ISAs in version 2.1. We've made a few changes, they're mainly relatively small changes. Um, We've got a compiler which is Clang LVM based. We've got a basic <coughs> debugger. We've obviously got this FPGA implementation. Um, sadly, we don't have a portrait of Jan Dan, but he left this on the whiteboard for us. Um, and we've got the simulator, which Simon's going to talk about now. 